Good afternoon, Eastern Washington. This is Matt Shea, and welcome to Patriot Radio, broadcasting live from the capital of free Washington and soon-to-be Liberty State, Spokane Valley. Brought to you once again by the committee to elect Matt Shea, Republican, in the legacy of Dr. Stan Monteith, bringing you the story behind the story in the news behind the news. And once again, it's not about right or left, it's about right and wrong. About our hope being not in man, but in Jesus Christ. About not ending in prayer, but also moving to action. About Ephesians 2, 5 through 6, God making us alive together with Christ and raising us up with him and seating us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, in the NASB, it's in the past tense. But really, I think to get the fullness of it, it's already happened, it's always happening, and it always will happen. It's continuing to happen. We are raised up with him. And this is an idea outside of time, as Chuck Missler says sometimes on his show. And I think if we realize that, it should allow us to focus on the fact that the, that the Lord of the universe has all of this under control. He knew what was going to happen before the beginning of time. And all of the craziness that's happening around the world, all that crazy, he knew that was going to happen. And he put us in this time for just such a moment and just such a time as this, if... If we are paying attention. And I'm going to read one more time A.W. Tozer's quote about, it's from God and men. This is about men in the church. And, you know, some people get a little offended at this kind of stuff. But I got to tell you something. You know, there are multiple times in scriptures where God is referred to is Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies. God is a warrior. There's no question about that. And and I, I just, I don't like this idea of shying away from that. Because you're only getting part of the picture if you do that. And the admonishment of A.W. Tozer, I think, is is very prescient for today with everything that's happening. What are we doing as men in the church? What are we doing as women in the church? But his specific quote is directed at men. Quote, the church at this moment needs men, the right kind of men, bold men. We languish for men who feel themselves expendable in the warfare of the soul, who cannot be frightened by threats of death, because they have already died to the allurements of this world. Such men will be free from the compulsions that control weaker men. They will not be forced to do things by the squeeze of circumstances. Their only compulsion will come from within or from above. This kind of freedom is necessary if we are to have prophets in our pulpits again instead of mascots, end quote. And one of the things that prophets used to do in the Old Testament was call the people. They also called leaders, no question about it, but the people to account. Called leaders to account. They stood up and they said, that is wrong. That is not what the Lord's will is for the people. And that lack of confrontation today in a godly manner is one of the reasons our culture is sliding into oblivion, slouching toward Gomorrah, as Judge Bork said. And we talk about the Second Amendment, we talk about the First Amendment, all all of those things are symptoms They're symptoms of individual heart issues across this country. Do we really put God at the center of our lives? Do we really serve without complaining? 
show up when it's not convenient. Put our arms around people that are going through struggles, even when we're going through struggles at the same time. And while all that's going on, be able to still stand up and call our leaders and our nation and our communities and our churches and our business to account. Well, you don't understand how busy my life is, Matt. Well, I I invite anybody to take a look and see how packed my calendar is. And look, it is not easy. I'm not going to mince words. It is not easy. It is hard. It is difficult. You have to constantly subsume your own desires. You have to constantly think about whatever else is happening, not just in your family, but with other people in your life. Make time for them. It's hard. But that's what Christ called us to do. And we always talk about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. A lot of times we forget about making disciples and showing love tangibly to our neighbor. And what does that mean? That means you got to take the time when your neighbor, a new neighbor moves in, for example, put together a nice basket for them, welcome them to the neighborhood. That takes time. It takes time to get to know your neighbors today and With everything happening in the world, we should know who our neighbors are. And it's so fascinating to me. When when you go out into rural areas of Washington State, rural areas of Idaho, rural areas of Montana, and other places in the country, but those are the ones that I've had the experience with. And you talk to folks out there. They are helping people on a daily basis. They they know who their neighbors are. They know if their neighbor, you know, is, is on hard times. Neighbor doesn't even have to ask for help. They know their neighbor needs help, and they just help them. And they, they know that's going to come back around later. I was up in Ferry County at the Lincoln Day, wonderful group of people up there in Republic, Washington. right? And they, they know who their neighbors are. But the other thing is, and it's so interesting, these folks live such a busy life with all of the, the, the thaw that's happening and the animals and the calving and all the things that are happening, and yet they're hospitable, They're willing to help their neighbors, and they're willing to show up at events to hold their leaders accountable and to hold their state accountable. Great folks up there. And that's what this is about. It's not about sitting on the sideline or always feeling sorry for ourselves. And look, I I get into that where I'll feel sorry for myself and, oh, nobody knows how much I'm doing and nobody knows all this. Look, we're all doing a lot. But are we doing what God called us to do in the way that he called us to do it? And that brings us now to your daily intelligence briefing on the international front. In the Middle East, okay, I've got, I got several articles I've got to go through, and I've got some real-time text messages here, too, uh, from contacts uh, back east. So first we'll start with... The Russian U.N. ambassador warned, quote, he cannot exclude, end quote, the possibility of direct conflict with the United States over Syria. In addition to that, the United Kingdom, their cabinet, gave Prime Minister May approval for taking action in Syria. In addition to that, the Russians... Well, actually, let me back up. This is very interesting. This is coming from KHQ, actually. The Emergency Operations Center has been activated at the Idaho nuclear plant caused by a rupture of a barrel with radioactive sludge. Okay, so that's occurred at an Idaho nuclear site. Okay, but understand something that Now emergency operations are up and running in places in the United States. And yes, they might be unrelated to what I'm talking about in Syria, but the timing is kind of interesting. In addition to that, the Russians have moved 11 Navy ships out of port in the event of a U.S. military strike. 
you have them moving their assets from Homs and Sherat back to Latakia, which is one of their main bases. So they're withdrawing. However, the Russians have spun up most of their strategic rocket forces. In addition to that, you've got United States, you've got another United States uh, carrier group headed for the Mediterranean, the Truman Carrier Group, headed for the Mediterranean. So things are uh, continuing to be very tense. Now, Trump did say publicly, well, didn't say when we were going to strike. What it seems like right now, based on some of the things that are coming out, is that, they're, that the United States is trying to build a solid coalition to go into Syria. So with the, the United Kingdom getting buy-off from the cabinet, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, their prime minister getting buy-off from the cabinet, uh, with some things happening quietly behind the scenes with Saudi Arabia and other countries, that's what it appears is happening. Interestingly enough, Vladimir Putin had a sharp exchange, and this coming to us from Deb Kefile, had a sharp exchange with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu telling Netanyahu to stand down on Syria. And the Israeli Prime Minister turning around and saying, we are not going to give Iran a strategic beachhead right near our border. It's not going to happen. So... You have now the Russians and the Israelis at uh, pretty big odds. So a lot going on, and uh, we're going to keep, you know, keep focused on this. My guest today is going to be talking about why preparedness still is important. And uh, her name is Shelby Gallagher, not her real name, actually. But she is coming out with the latest in the 299 Days universe, A Great State. And we're going to be talking about what are some of the things that we haven't seen before that could happen. Well, one of the things that's being talked about is electronic warfare or hacking. In other words, a mass cyber attack occurs as retaliation instead of bullets so stay tuned for that. Also, and this still it has not changed to my knowledge, but the French Special Forces and also some Marines, U.S. Marines, are opposite Turkish forces in northern Syria as well, holding a line there. On the other side of the world, China, while they're premier has eased up on the tariff war rhetoric. The South China Sea, you have a Chinese aircraft carrier group, nose to nose with a U.S. aircraft carrier group. There's a lot happening there. And as, as I mentioned before, you know, it seems like Putin and Trump should have a summit. And maybe they're headed that way. I, I don't, I don't know. What I do know is that China right now, North Korea, is probably not the main event to be focusing on. What's happening in Syria is. And I have had conversations with former Special Forces folks that uh, they're questioning whether or not this chemical attack in Syria was actually done by Syrian forces. Whether or not it was, and they, this is their word that they use, false flag. It's also kind of interesting that the United States, at least in the United Nations, is saying that it is absolutely confident the Syrians used chemical weapons on their own people. Clearly, the national security team is uh, discussing options right now. Um, but I think it's important, again, not just to focus on the United States, but to focus on what Britain is doing. And now you also have the French president, Emmanuel Macron, saying, quote, that he has proof chemical weapons were used. 
And so sounds like the French are getting on board, too. So the United States looks like it's building a coalition, like I said before. But again, this is kind of the main event. Not necessarily what's happening in the South China Sea, although we should be paying attention to that. Also on the national front, uh, this raid on Trump's lawyer. Mr. Cohen saying he's not happy about it. Well, obviously he's not. But the fact that a judge signed a search warrant of a lawyer's office is absolutely incredible. Now, you remember back in the Bundy case in the trial down in Oregon where their lawyer was tasered in the courtroom for defending his client. And now a lawyer's office is raided and attorney-client privilege is essentially eviscerated. Well, you know, you trust us with your attorney-client privilege documents. And this is all after the Russian collusion case collapsed, and now they have to find something to continue to go. It's, you know, and I, I'm surprised that Trump has been so calm with this. I mean, it's just... You know, with everything going on, I mean, he's got to assess the intelligence about the chemical weapons attack that allegedly occurred in Syria. He's got to deal with this and his lawyer, and he's still undeterred, a couple days ago, signed an order to require recipients of federal aid programs to work. So he signed an executive order, which is intended to force recipients of food assistance, Medicaid, and low-income housing subsidies, subsidies to join the workforce or face the loss of their benefits. And here's the thing. That was in the New York Times. So it's pretty amazing he's staying on his agenda with all these other things that could be pretty dramatic uh, distractions out there. Also on the national front, so gun sales are up fairly dramatically, <laughs> as everybody could guess. Um we talked about the fact that there are a couple places in the United States that are now actively calling for gun confiscation of law-abiding citizens. In other words, they're saying we're going to ban so-called assault weapons, and you have 60 days to turn them in, and if you don't turn them in after that, essentially we're going to be confiscating. Okay. People said that that would never happen in America. It is happening in America, and I want to make some one point very, very clear. People that advocate that, the ban of an AR-15 or the confiscation of firearms of law-abiding citizens in particular are in rebellion against the Constitution of the United States. I want to be very clear. They are the ones that are in rebellion. They are the ones that are going against a God-given, unalienable right and trying to trample it. And what they are really advocating is civil war. Because there is a group of people in America and a group of veterans that are not going to let that happen. And so I don't know what all the snowflakes think is going to be the end result of all this. But the whole reason that we have the ability to own an AR-15 is because it is preparation for the moment that they try to take it away. And... And this ridiculous argument that it only applies, applied to muskets is not, I mean, you, you have to read the Founding Fathers documents. There is absolutely no question that they believed that citizens should be armed to prevent tyranny. There is no question of it. That is beyond doubt. And so when you have people saying, oh, it's only applying to muskets. Well, okay, so the First Amendment only applies if you have kind of really bumpy paper and a quill pen and an ink jar and a horse to get the letter to your friends, right? That's that's the only time the First Amendment applies. And and I you know what? I think that that's what they probably believe because in California in California there has been a bill introduced by a state senator to essentially require fact checkers Check news before it's published. Can you say Pravda under the Soviet Union? I mean, these these things exist. The right to bear arms. 
the right to free speech, the right to conscience, to prevent the rise of tyranny. In fact, they exist for the moment when somebody says you can't have free speech. You can't own an AR-15. You can't have a right of conscience in all matters of religious sentiment. Those things exist precisely for the moment when some buddy who has no sense of history says, hey, why don't we try that? And oh, by the way, those are always precursors to the attempt at turning a country into a dictatorship and subjugating a group of people. Also on the national front, Jim Rickards, renowned analyst, does a lot in the economic world, saying that uh, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, is going to launch sometime late April, May, maybe later, a digital crypto SDR, strategic drawing rights, as a world currency. In other words, the strategic drawing rights, which is a basket of uh, currencies, Bank of International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, uses this. And the IMF wants to introduce that, though, as a digital currency so that the U.S. petrodollar would no longer have the preeminence it currently does. That would obviously have a dramatic effect on our economy. Maybe Trump knows this. Maybe that's why the tariffs are happening and a lot of this is occurring to protect the United States economy from what's about to what's about to happen. On top of that, on the national front, do we really have privacy anymore? Facebook, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg basically apologizing, being contrite before Congress. Oops, we didn't mean to listen that much through our app, to all the conversations that were happening and collect all that. Of course they did. That's why they created it. So you got a lot of people out there saying, hey, Matt, why don't you put up an article with all these alternative social media platforms and and, uh, things for encryption? So if you've got a pen and paper, I'm going to go through those very quickly right now. Because it's important you reclaim your your privacy. And if somebody says to you, I don't have anything to hide, it's not about you. It's not about that. It's about the integrity of the system, because look, if we don't have privacy to communicate, again, tyranny can get a foothold. It's about denying information to people that they shouldn't really have anyway if you don't want them to have it. And if you don't get that, you don't really get the concept of America. So here are a couple social media platforms that you can use. The first one is MeWe, M-E-W-E. I'm actually already on there. MeWe. The other social media platform that you can use is called Gab, G-A-B, Gab. You can find it really, really simple. Those are some alternatives. And, And I think most people are going to start shifting away from Facebook toward these things that actually work. And protect your privacy. Additionally, if you want to encrypt your text messages, your phone calls, and your emails, which you should, as a matter of course. And and, and it's interesting to me, too. This really kind of, to me, is a matter of national security from the sense that the Chinese are trying to create profiles in every American and, and essentially use big data as a weapon. So we would be denying foreign governments the ability to create profiles in Americans and try to manipulate portions of the population. So when people say, well, it's a national security uh, issue that they have now, no, actually, it's the other way around. The Chinese and the Russians want those things so that they can have influence in the country and manipulate, or at least attempt to manipulate, population groups. So if, you're, if you were kind of struggling with that part of it, think about it the other way. So again, MeWe and Gab. All right. The next, for securing your text messages and encrypting them. The two best that I know of. Somebody may send me something different. Two best that I know of from the, the folks that I talk to are Signal, S-I-G-N-A-L, Signal, 
and wire. W-I-R-E. If you want to encrypt your emails, you can encrypt using ProtonMail, you can encrypt using StartMail, or you can encrypt using Unseen Mail with it's, it, if you use Apple, it, it's very simple. If you have an Apple computer, it's super, super easy. It's called GPG Suite, GPG Suite, and it'll help you download everything. You can also use a, a, an email client host called Thunderbird where all your secured emails can go into one place, and you can add another layer of encryption on top of it. It sounds complicated, but there's a ton of videos out there on how to do this and a lot of little chat rooms talking about how to do this. So it, it really is Easy, you just got to get used to it, get it set up, and use it. All right. On the local front, Red Pill Expo coming June 21st through 23rd here in downtown Spokane at the Convention Center. A lot of great speakers. Yours truly will be there as well. And you can find them at Red Pill Expo online. And if uh, you can't make it to the event, you can also stream it live. Also on the local front, Freedom Project, with Dr. Duke Pesta coming uh, May 5th, 3 o'clock, at Center Place in Spokane Valley, May 5th, 3 o'clock, and he's going to be talking about the crisis in American education and what the solution is, and I should say solutions are. Also on the local front, the March for Our Rights rally, Saturday, April 21st, 11 o'clock, at Franklin Park, right near the Northtown Mall in Spokane. A lot of people either going to that one or going to the one in Olympia. Uh, going to be a great uh, day, great time for a lot of folks. Also on the local front, April 16th, a great state is going to be launched. We'll be talking to, uh, with Shelby Gallagher here in a second. Uh, so the latest in the 299 Days universe. And lastly, Liberty Academy this Saturday, April 14th, 9.30 a.m. in Templins, at, in Post Falls, the Templins Resort there in Post Falls. Liberty Academy is capitalism moral. Going to have a bunch of speakers on that, and uh, you should be able to get some really good information to fight back on some of the socialist talking points that are out there from the Bernie Sanders crowd. And that's the briefing. Remember, the antidote to dependency and socialism is to be a God-fearing, self-reliant, freedom-loving American. Thank you to everybody that's been praying for me and the show and Victoria and everybody else that's associated with us. There's a lot of people that help put this on. And thank you for praying for them as well. And make sure you go to Facebook slash Patriot Radio US. Like the page, share it with your friends and family. And if you want to help us stay on the air, you can always go to VoteShea.com. Send us a donation and uh, help keep the message of freedom and liberty loud and proud throughout the future state of liberty. Well, again, my guest today is Shelby Gallagher, not her real name, author of A Great State, the latest in the 299 Days Universe. Shelby, thanks for being on Patriot Radio with me today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I always like to joke and say um, it's good to talk to you, Governor Shea, right? <laughs> Well, we just got to get Liberty State first, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's that's yes. where we're at. So, well, how how have you been? How how are things going? You guys have have launched out on this new project. You're doing this with Glenn Tate. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about what kind of brought this about and and what the book is all about. Very good. Yes. Um, what the what brought this about for me as the author of this was about a year and a half ago. Um, as people read the books, this will make more sense. So just remember this. Um, there's a family cabin that my family had owned for years and years in Colorado, and it had always been my, in my mind and in my plans, my bug out location. Where to go when stuff goes south, when, you know, the collapse happens. And I live in Western Oregon, so the very real concerns about that. So at that time, it's about October, right before the election, that cabin was sold. So for those of us who are preppers, imagine not your bug out location suddenly not being available to you. Next thing that happened was then, uh, living in Western Oregon, uh, Trump was elected, which was great, but um, Oregon had this reaction to it, specifically in Portland, with riots, very violent, um, lawless, corrupt. They were allowed to continue when they shouldn't have been anywhere else. Um, more conservative would not have allowed such chaos and, and really criminal activity to happen. 
So as I'm watching this happen, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I might need to bug out and I have nowhere to go. This is not a good, <laughs> it's not a good uh, combination. So out of that came um, my imagination kind of caught on and, and I was thought, what would happen if I needed to bug out? What would that look like if I could go to Colorado? And what would that look like? And so that was kind of the original idea for getting it started. And uh, and that's where I start. That that was my inspiration, I suppose. But um, just in, in the year and a half since then, many of the I wrote the first two books in about six months. Many of the things that I had fictionalized had, you know, in my mind thought, okay, worst case scenario, what could happen if this happened? They're actually starting to come true now. And it's it's kind of alarming when you think of you know freedom and loving with the principles of our founding fathers, and it's it's alarming to see the worst case scenario happen to our to our freedoms and to our rights. So, does that answer the question? I think I, there's a second part I missed there, though. No, it's okay. I, I really want to let's get into that a little bit about what it has been alarming specifically to you about you know the degradation in a, that's occurring in America, some of the alarming things that are happening, obviously, internationally. I mean, what stands out to you? I think for me, and especially in Oregon, again, is how much um, I, I really expected after those riots kind of died down, I really expected kind of Oregon to act independently, because so, we have a very, very left-leaning governor. Expected that to be kind of... Um, kind of a tolerate the president. Instead, what happened was this digging in of her heels. She comes right out and, and puts together her little project called Resist Trump, immediately makes Oregon. And this is straight out of my, this is the eerie one that really stuck out. I had already written using the term sanctuary state. Within a few months, she declared Oregon a sanctuary state. Um, that was the big one. How much she's, she's really uh, put a lot of angst between the state of Oregon and uh, or the new president. And, of course, Washington State and California State are following suit. Just today, here's another good example. And this, again, I, as I hear this, I'm like, I wish you guys could read my book, too, because this is what's happening. The mayor of Portland comes right out and says in front of a, you know, a very friendly crowd in front of cameras when it's really easy to say these things, I will go to jail before I allow anybody in the city of Portland who's an immigrant to to be deported. So he's digging in just as much as the governor is. So these are all political things that are happening. And all these things, you and I would agree, uh, Oregon being a sanctuary state, Portland being a sanctuary city, it's, it just creates, un it's, it's very unsafe. What happens is we have a, a lot of uh, legal uh, people here illegally that shouldn't be that we've deported, ICE has deported over and over again. They keep coming back and they keep committing hor horrendous crimes against Americans against taxpaying citizens, and it's and it's horrifying. It, it really is horrifying. You know, I I was uh, talking with a couple experts on on this issue about what's happening in Syria, and one of the things they said is, well, you know, the next battle is not going to be fought with bullets, but but ones and zeros. And so, you know, could there be a cyber attack in retaliation? What would that do to the U.S. grid? What would that do to uh, you know our banking infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, in our economy as a whole? And uh, it, it's 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 so fast moving. Uh, when you talk to people about, you know, when you were writing your book, what are they saying about these types of things and these types of threats that are out there? It, here's what's interesting is, um, when, well, first of all, when you live in a, in a progressive area, you, you don't, you don't put your, stick your head up too high, right? <laughs> so, um, but when I say to people, you know, it's kind of sad that this, this crime just happened when that person shouldn't have even been in our community. They shouldn't have even been a neighbor of ours. And I'll say to them also, I can't go to Mexico. I can't go to the Middle East. I can't go to any of these other countries and just walk right in and expect free stuff, free services, and expect to, uh, to not be arrested and, and probably hurt very badly in jail if not murdered. I mean, that's what happens. Why is America the only one that has to have such loose borders? And I don't understand it. And so that's usually what I take when I talk to people within my community. But uh, most people are afraid. I will say this, especially when you have riots like they were, and uh, yeah, it's, I think there's I think there's a fear that goes unsaid because it's politically incorrect, and I think political correctness is tyranny. There's no question about that. I totally agree with you, and I, I want to kind of get to the mm -hmm. you know 299 days universe. How is this book going to fit in? I mean, Glenn Tate's series, uh, read by virtually everybody I know, uh, and just laid out a really comprehensive 
approach to thinking about things and, and different scenarios. How is your book going to fit into this? It's going to, it's, it's basically a, a different person's perspective of a collapse and where it's going to fit into the Glenn Tate universe is in book three, the main character of uh, a great state, Julie will be in Pierce point. And I'm just going to leave it at that, but there's going to be a, a meeting of, uh, Grant Matson from 209 Nine Days, and you'll see. And so, make, it, listeners may say, "Well, why would you need to do that?" Well, when it becomes so unsafe, when you have, um, it becomes so unsafe to travel within some of these collapsed communities. It, this is what happens. So, so that's where it'll fit in eventually. But where this, the perspective of the book comes from, it's very different than Grant Matson's. His was from kind of a, um, a community built militia. Um, a community that comes together and creates that government infrastructure that's collapsed, and it's for the, and it's a very small prepped community, and how they deal with kind of creating a new, really creating a new government. This is um, from the perspective of a single mom in the middle of a collapse who is a prepper and gets out and leaves and 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 has to find safety for herself and her children or her child in this case, and. And I, I come at it from that point of view because this is the numbers that I know. 50% of children born in the United States right now are born to single parents. And when they step out of the hospital, out of their hospital room after those children are born, they are given and given and offered and marketed to free government services to keep those numbers going. Government has to always keep signing people up for services, social services, whatever. And when those social services are gone, there's going to be a human tragic effect. And we've seen that in other collapses where suddenly women and children are the first to be victimized or the first to um, suffer in a collapse situation. And I see that happening here in the United States. I see it specifically happening in socialist states that really push for people to be on those sorts of programs. Let's talk about uh, Venezuela as kind of a template. Did you look at that as you were kind of writing your book, or what, what templates did you use to write it? You just caught me. Yes, at the same at the at about the time that I started writing this, I was, and it's not easy to find stuff about Venezuela. You're not going to hear it on the news. You're not going to see it at five o'clock on your main station. You're going to have to look in secondary news sources. But the riots that started, uh, or that went on for about four to six months or so in Venezuela, I was watching them and how um, neighbor fighting against neighbor. You have one a neighbor that's in the military and is being forced by the new socialist government. Governor, or I'm sorry, the new force to, oh, prime minister, president, whatever, dictator of Venezuela is now, he has to go to work every day and fight against his neighbor. That is a, a patriot, who would we call a patriot, and how violent that got. And then the collapse happened financially. I also met somebody at the time that was visiting the United States from Venezuela. We're sitting in a restaurant and um, he's and we're, I'm talking to him and he's like, oh yeah, I'm sitting here looking at all this food left over on, on plates and I just want to scoop it all up and take it home because um, food is suddenly gone. And this is during the early parts of the riot. So now, yes, the initial collapse when it's kind of raw and panicky and then the secondary thing and that and yes you just hit on it number one thing that happens to women in a collapse is they start selling themselves sadly and their children to feed themselves it's tragic and Ugh. and i've been watching that it's very sad so most people don't know you know they're like well uh, you know that this whole prepper thing always kind of gets me a little antsy it makes me anxious makes me mm -hmm. fearful I've never found it that way. I've always kind of found it that, that it takes fear away, actually. What got what got you involved in looking into this and, and to the point of actually writing a book about it? Very good. I come at it from, I don't come at it from the prepping point of view. I came to the prepping thing a little bit later. Um, I know most people I talk to, if you talk to Glenn Tate, he'll say that he started in 2008 when Obama came into office. I was a, a few years after that because as a single mom, it's the whole, I was, I, I was couponing. And the big movement at the time was kind of that extreme couponing television show that was big. I took a couple of classes on it, and it, you just can't do just I say this every time, you can't do that anymore, but you can still get good deals. But one of the tenants, one of the big kind of foundational principles of couponing is stockpiling things that are stockpiling things. When they're super duper good, great, awesome deal, get a thousand of them and stockpile them. Well, that fits really nicely into prepping 
really nicely, getting super duper great non-perishable deals on things and prepping for them. And so it was during that time that I was prepping and I, and I got into firearms. I got into Second Amendment sorts of things from the feeling, like you just said, of feeling unsafe. I want to make sure that if somebody comes through that door, I can protect my family. And that's how I came at it. So I'm a little bit odd that way, but I think the, the message is, is very much the same. Be prepared for, for anything, right? Right, absolutely. And what would your message be? Because I've found that for a lot of men, this is kind of a no-brainer. We always, we always prep, you know, we, we, we hoard extra parts or extra oil or extra gas or extra this or extra that, extra, extra uh, firearms, you know, extra bullets. We, you know, it's, for guys, it's kind of a, we just kind of do it. What would be your message to the single moms out there and, and uh, maybe some, some wives out there that are questioning, ah, is this really worth it to do this? Very good. I would say, and you hit on it just a moment ago, I have felt the most safe and most um, stress relief when I have been a prepper. And I would say prepping is very different in an urban, high-density city environment than it is in outside of that. In an urban environment, you've got to be a little sneaky. You can't let your neighbors know what you're doing. They can't see you walk in the house with, you know, a box the size of a rifle that says Mossberg on it. You, you can't do that. So, um, but I also know there's the, there's the normalcy bias that crosses all genders. I know a lot of men and women that live in the city that are just like, oh, you know, if something happens, electricity goes out, it's okay. We've got Kansas Soup, and you can walk up the street to the grocery store because, every, you know, every few blocks there's a grocery store or whatever. Yeah, but in a collapse, there's going to be the looting. Those things are going to close down, and it's, you know, it's not – It's that's not quite the same. I, so prepping – the prepping message, I think, almost needs to infiltrate the city dweller more than it does women or men. But women, I think, have a tendency to feel already. Oh, I've, here's a good example. I was talking to a woman a few years ago. We were talking about firearms, and she said, uh, well, I don't worry about it because my husband's a veteran, and he, he'll take care of me. And I said, well, how many hours a day are you home alone with your children? Most working hour days. So he's not always going to be there. So it's one of those things that, that I would say to everyone, women, men, make sure that in any one moment you are ready and prepared to take care of yourself because there will be those moments when you are the only one who can take care of yourself. You have to be your first responder. That is, you know, that kind of individual self-reliance um, it seemed to being it seems to be like it's it's being attacked today mm-hmm. because you know it's well that's selfish or that's mm-hmm. this or that's that but really self reliance was kind of the core of America especially as we came west yeah oh yeah yeah absolutely here's another one that uh, an example that um, helped me out quite a bit let's go all the way back to Katrina I remember watching some footage out of when Katrina first happened and it was really quick and I don't know if I could ever pull it up on YouTube or something but you know, some um, news guy is walking around putting microphones in people's faces. Hey, you know, how are you guys doing? Do you need whatever? They're just trying to get um, uh, sound bites. They go to the, I'll never forget, they go to this one man who's standing on his porch and he said, you know what? We got a generator. We have food. We have tents. We're good here. We're good. Go help someone else. We're good here. Keep going. Go help someone else. So obviously that guy's a prepper. He he was prepared for this. Goes to the next person, who was just just distraught, upset, angry. I've paid for my insurance my whole life. I've paid my taxes. Why is no one here to help me? And I just remember watching that, going, I want to be the first guy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's better to be in a position to be able to love your neighbor in that kind of a tangible mm-hmm. fashion, right? Exactly. In either either saying, hey, look, don't don't waste any supplies here, or uh, hey, you know, we could help you in this particular instance. Exactly. There's so much more freedom, so much more safety, and so much more just stress relief. Just you, you, you will take care of you. You will take care of your clan, your family, your group, your community much better than any government agency ever could. Well, you and, and the mysterious Glenn Tate have mm-hmm. contacts all over the country. What's your sense right now? I mean, are we on the cusp of World War III? I mean, it's it's really, it's kind of unnerving some of the things that are actually um, happening out there right now. What, what's your sense? My sense is that in in a very ideological way, 
I think we are, ideologically, we are in World War III. And it's a, it's a fight for the message. It's a fight over words. It's um, political correctness versus freedom. I think those, there is almost a war, a, a battle over that. Um, I do think with what's happening with the West Coast in particular, when you have, you know, Ted Wheeler, Mayor Ted Wheeler out of Portland saying what he said today, you have the governor of California um, saying in a press conference to President Trump, what, two or three weeks ago, the president has just declared war. There's some fight, there's some, you know, sand kicking going on here that I think they're, I really, especially with the West left coast, I do, I do think it, it, I don't see this just suddenly going away for sure. And for the listeners that may have missed it, what happened down in Portland? What did he say? He had a little press conference today, and oh my gosh, and I turned my phone off so that it wouldn't ring. But there's a headline today, let me pull it up here really quick, where he says, and I'm going to just kind of drag out the time a little bit here. He says that he vows to fight uh, for immigrants, even if it means going to jail, so it's the whole, if ICE comes in, if the federal, if the federal government comes in, if um, immigration at the, on the national level come in and force him to have to deport, to follow federal laws regarding immigration, he'll go to jail. He's willing to do that. Wow. Yeah, the rhetoric is just amping up. Well, I want to get back to, you know, I've got a, a lot of listeners and, and uh you know, one of them texted me actually just as we were talking about the fact that, you know, one tree took out power for over a million people and it can be just it can be nature but when you're in a crisis situation there aren't the the facilities or the people to go back out and fix things even though it's it's nature that that is causing it one of the other things that came up is you have a great supporter out there that has a very actually several that have a very large family Mm -hmm. so how can how can large families prepare what would be your tips for them you know what? Here, that's interesting you say that because I think so many people, I, and I know that I haven't helped without how I've spoken today. It's like be your own first responder. But on the other hand, I think the the prepping community, those of us who get into this, those of us who go to the conferences, I go to those because I know that I, when a collapse happens, I can't do it all. I can't be the doctor. I can't be the the firefighter. I can't be the the, the the warrior. I can't do it all. I can't be the meal preparer. So what, what, where prepping really works well is when you have your community, you have your neighbors, your small communities. You have the communities like Grant Matson, Grant Matson's case in 299 days. So if you have a large family, then I think it's finding each person's gifts, interests. All right. When a collapse happens, you're in charge of this. When a collapse happens, that's what you're in charge of. So go make sure you're really good at it and start building up your skills and also your supplies. With all of those folks out there that do have a, a lot of uh, a lot of family members, you know they've already probably done some kind of drills or coordination out mm-hmm. there for a fire or for other things. And this is just kind of an extension to that. Is what you're saying? Exactly. Exactly. So, if you could plug your book, where can people go uh, pre-order it? Uh, and you know, how can maybe somebody get an autographed copy? I don't know. Very I don't know if that's an cool. option. I'm so glad you asked. Yes, and, and there's been some news on that today. I'm sorry, I just interrupted you. Did I clip you off there? No, no, go ahead. Okay, so you can find um, a greatstate.com. That's my website. Um, you can find Shelby Gallagher, author, on uh, social media, especially Facebook. That's where I do most of my uh, um, grandstanding, I suppose. And uh, you can uh, pre-order the Kindle copy right now and go to uh, Amazon and pre-order it. It'll be downloaded to your Kindle on the 16th. What's interesting is that you can pre-order the hard copy book from Prepper Press. If you just go to PrepperPress.com and click on the book, you can pre-order it. Here's what's interesting. I just found out today. People who pre-ordered the hard copy, they're actually getting them. They've been shipped today. People have them in their hands right now. So if you want a book copy, it sounds like you can get one pretty, pretty doggone quick. Um, if, they, if you want to get a hard copy with my signature on it, and I would love to meet you, we are doing a launch on the 21st at um, Surplus Ammo and Arms in Tacoma, and that's one of Glenn Tate's favorite gun stores. We're working on a tour-ish kind of, uh, well, obviously down in Oregon, that's where I live, 
and we're also working on ones in Eastern Oregon and Eastern Washington. So um, stay tuned for May 4th and 5th. We're finalizing some details on Oregon locations. But we will also, to answer your question specifically, I need to put this together, make it so that you can order a signed copy as well online. So stay tuned and pay attention to social media. We'll let people know how to do that. So I I really want to, you know, work with you guys, especially if you're coming over here to Eastern Washington. So I look forward to that. That's really super exciting. Uh, In in the final few minutes that we have, for for those folks that are out there that are young people, that are millennials, who say, ah, this is a bunch of old folks that are worrying about nothing, what would be your message to them, and especially young women? Young women is, oh, my gosh. I would say... um, just look, honestly, just uh, Google Venezuela uh, collapse and start reading and start asking yourself, what can you do right now to keep that from happening to you? Young women in Venezuela right now, it was, it was an economic and political collapse there, are suffering and um, they are traumatized. Uh, you can look at the war-torn eastern, uh, you know, east, uh, Syria, Pakistan, all of that. Human trafficking is huge. Human trafficking on the West Coast already in Oregon, Washington, California is huge. It will just get worse during a collapse. So if you are a young millennial woman, find your way in that and find within yourself, ask yourself, what am I going to do differently than anyone else so that I don't ever have to face choices or face danger? And I would say that to the men as well. What are you willing to do to protect yourself and the women and family members in your life that will be faced with those horrors that will happen. I think it will happen. So is this going to be the first book in a series? I mean, you guys going to launch kind of another series as part of the 299 Days universe? Good question. This this is a great state. It is going to be a trilogy. This first book that's coming out in a couple days, that is the first. It's called A Divide. The second one tentatively is called The Aftermath, which will really be very, very, very detailed on what I envision a collapse to be like in Oregon, and I do not hold back. I think it will be ugly, especially because the political landscape has just set the table for it to be ugly. Um, yeah, and there, there's going to be a third one. And um, at this point, that's all I know about, and that's all I have the bandwidth to deal with. But, <laughs> you know, the creative juices can always flow. There should be, I would think, that there should be others as well. Well, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. And i got to ask you, mm-hmm. in the last minute we've got – do you support Liberty State? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> we have we have so many folks out there. They're gonna be they're just gonna be excited to hear that. And uh, I don't know, maybe you guys could incorporate a Liberty State into a book. I don't know. I'm just throwing ideas out there just because I can. It's my show. So you know, <laughs> you and I appreciate that. Keep read the book. I think you'll see. I I kind of already have. Wink, wink. Oh, that is so awesome. Look at now. Everybody's like, all right, now we got to read it. We have to read it now. We have yes. to read it now. The tour well, map on the front cover is there for a very specific reason. <laughs> I love it. Shelby, thank you very much for joining me on Patriot Radio today. Love what you guys are doing and uh, want to have you back on again here soon, okay? Sounds good. Love to do it. Thank you. All right. God bless. Mm-hmm. Shelby Bye. Gallagher, a great state. You can go to greatstate.com. And uh, in fact, I'm going to pull that up right now, but... Uh, Prepper Press is where you can order the hard copies right now. Sounds like they're already shipping, even though it's before April 16th. Um, Wow. These are the kind of things that just, I don't know, these encourage me because you got great folks who are are provoking you to thought and action, right? That that some of these things are are just about being self-sufficient, self-reliant again, just like our ancestors were during the Great Depression. All these folks that survived the Great Depression, you know, they they had canning uh, down to just an absolute science. They had root cellars. I know my grandma, her pantry was always stocked because they always knew there could be a possibility sometime They might need that, and they might need it not just for their family, but they might need it for their neighbors as well. And that's one of the things that's really great about uh, this and about the book that Shelby's, you know, writing is it's turning the perspective to where it should be. And that is, this is one of those things that is really simple to do. You don't have to do it all at once, especially for large families. You can do it a little bit at a time. You can take your little bite of the apple at a time. And you make such a dramatic difference 
if something does happen. And if it doesn't, you can take it down to the food bank or you can uh, have your church do a huge meal for the homeless. I mean, it's just a positive thing to do. And with all the abundance that we have here in the United States of America right now, it just seems to make sense that we would want to store a little bit away for a rainy day. For a day when somebody else might need it. Maybe it's not raining on us. Maybe it's raining on our neighbor. But we're ready for it. And we have the opportunity, too, to witness to those folks, hey, this stuff that I'm giving you right now, this came from Jesus Christ, and let me tell you about him. And what, an, what an awesome opportunity if we take it and we take it seriously. So it's not just about what's happening in Syria or China or cyber attacks or all this stuff. No, it's about being self-reliant, self-sufficient, and being able to put yourself in a position to help other people in a crisis. And you know what? That's really kind of what sums up the initial pilgrims and Puritans that came to America. They had to be self-reliant, but they, they did all of that for the purpose of furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, if I had one thing to say today, one message to get out to all of you, that, that's what that is. For the gospel of Jesus Christ, to glorify and honor and praise Him. Well, you know, if, if you have the opportunity, please make it to this Liberty Academy event, 930, this Saturday the 14th, Templins and Post Falls. Is capitalism moral? You're going to hear a lot of great speakers, and you're going to be armed with a lot of great information. And I look forward to seeing all of you there. This is Matt Shea. Thank you for listening to me today on Patriot Radio. May God bless all of you. Truly, may he make this generation the greatest one that honors him.